Okay. We can't really think late in 11, so it's Don't worry. <laughs> the samples of the size in the first pair, and they work so good. Yeah, and when he opens them again, it fills. It's a brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What did you want? You want? Hello. Hi, hello. Lovely, <laughs> lovely to see you. Yes, thank you. I remember so, you from last year. Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> the, the, oh, my goodness, my <laughs> wife. Did you just tell my Say my wife, like, what, what are you doing to me? At least it's, at least, at least it's not in the neck. Oh, man. <laughs> and the, the day that the moderator comes. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's less. It's, 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 it's 12. <laughs> You just left. If you have, all goes wrong, if, so. if you have that with a Cuban cigar, you are completely yeah. off your head. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hello everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be all together. Have the opportunity of worshiping the Lord all together. We are today celebrating the wonderful visit of the moderator Sam and his wife Karen with us. And we thought for a long time that this is the most important thing happening on the 1st of October, like the visit of the moderator. But then one of my elders came on Friday and said, actually, there is something on top of that. Today is Coffee International Day too. <laughs> so so I, I am from Cuba, so I think that top up the visit, the coffee thing. So... <laughs> No, we are delighted to have you both here. It's a blessing for us. And to celebrate, uh, be aware we have Cuban coffee, which is number 12. And so hopefully you are going to enjoy it today. Deborah is already feeling the effects of the coffee. And so if something goes wrong today, it's, it's the coffee fault. So it's all good. We are delighted to be here. There is a couple of announcements that I want to, to make you aware of. It's October, and so midweek is back on, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, second and fourth Wednesday, we are going to be back in midweek. Remember, we are going to have the study, and then the following day at 9 a.m., you will have the podcast with whatever we have discussed. We are going to finish our 12 basic doctrines of the Christian faith this year, and so we are all ready to go and preach the gospel. For the teenagers, some of you have been asking me when is YF back, and you have been claiming for unfair monopoly and to pair unfair monopoly. And so today we are going to meet in the Mackey Hall for some board games and, and a banter all together. Also, Friday's lunch and fellowship, we, we launched uh, last Friday, and it was, it was a, good, a good fun than we have, and so we are doing it, we opening the door at half 10, and so you can either decide to come here, at the back there are two tables and have some games that you can play, it was a good banter, there are some things that were said in the games that I cannot repeat, but they were good, and then there is the pool table and the football and everything, if you want to come, you will not get a better lunch and dessert for three quid in any other side of town or even down south. You don't get that. So what we need is there is a piece of paper at the back with a sign in it because Norma will need the number to know how many people she is cooking for. It is good if there is more food because I can have doubles. But... The problem is when there is not enough food because more people came. So if you book yourself, you put your name in the back, and then we know how many people are we cooking on Fridays. And the difference this time is if you are a lad, you can come. If you are a lady, you can come. It's Friday's lunch and fellowship. So if you want to have a bite to eat and some fellowship, you are welcome to come too. So... <clears throat> 
The rest of the announcements are in our pages, and so just go back to those and check up all the things. And so also today, we have Joanne for Kids for a School, and so she, she is coming. Our junior church have been collecting money to, to help and support kids from a school, and then you are going to hear a bit more about Joanne and the work that they are doing later today. So this is a Bible passage, and it's found in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. This is what we read. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it is spring forth. Do you perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So as elders, we met yesterday in the morning to think more, to explore, and to pray about the path of the church and the vision and how do we want to share the good news. And this passage is a reflection of that. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. It doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter how much thought and effort we put into. He is the one that make a way. He is the one that made rivers in the desert. Let's bow and pray together. Father, what a blessing and privilege of being in your house. What a gift to be able to come and glorify your name. Father, we are giving thanks for the opportunity that we have today of praising your name. Father, we are praying that we will be able to just raise our voices and glorify you. Father, we are giving you thanks for the visit of Sam, Karen, and for the visit of Johan that are going to be sharing with us today. Father, open our ears to listen to your message. Open our hearts to follow your call. And Father, take away at this point in time any distractions that we may have. Take away all things that will stop us from coming to you. And Father, we know that during the week and even this morning we fail to come close to you, than the thing in our life just put on a stumbling block. So, Father, we are praying today that you will forgive our sins, that we will look upon Jesus Christ, the one that died on a cross for us, and the one that opened a way to have a river of living water in the middle of the desert of our life. In Jesus' name we pray, and your church say, Amen. Let's stand together and sing there is one name and living hope.
what a blessing the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The first reading today is found in the book of Romans, chapter 8, and I'm going to be reading from verse 31 to verse 38. As you know, I'm going to be reading from the ESP, and so if you have a app on your phone, you change it to the ESP, and then follow along God's word for us this morning. God everlasting love. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is this God who justifies? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that. Who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation of distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore as it is written? For your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor high, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God bless his word. Let's pray together. Father, we are given for this message that even though in the world we have affliction, you give us victory. Father, there is no much that we can do than to give thanks for Jesus Christ, than to give thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And Father, let us reflect in this word with gratitude in our heart and with the desire of living in that victory, of living in that living hope that is only found in Jesus Christ, in which name we pray and all say, Amen. So we have the blessing now that we have Joanne and coming and sharing with us. And I'm going to pass my microphone now. Um, Lynn's away this weekend, so unfortunately I'm, I've been delegated this task, but it's a nice task, I have to say. As Lynn was explaining to you a couple of weeks ago, um, each week when the kids come in, they bring a little um, money into the Coke bottle, but we're also really grateful for those in the congregation who support, and if anybody else would like to join in, feel free, it's not, it's not closed. Um, so if you want to see if your coppers, your odds, whatever, and just you know pass them across, it, it all mounts up. And we're delighted this morning that we can actually present Joanne a cheque for £700 for the work for Kids for School. Um, we've had a long connection with Kids for School, so it's, it's really nice this morning. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is great to be with you again this morning here in Mount Pottinger. I see a few familiar faces. Hello, Robin. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, so it is lovely and we, we so appreciate the support from this church. Uh, we know that your heart is in mission and you support many other uh, charities and organizations as well. So thank you for all that you do. Um, what we plan on doing with this money is we have a lot of our children who their families will grow crops around their houses and they're depending on the grains to come to grow their crops in order to feed their families but quite often the rains fail. And so we are going to step in and we are going to be able to provide at least 40 families with enough food that are going to feed them for a whole month. So this is a fantastic amount. I want to thank all of the children, all of the leaders for, from the children for all of their hard work and also the congregation and, and everyone involved with uh, raising this fantastic total. So thank you very, very much on behalf of our children in Tanzania. Thank you.
So boys and girls, you are going to be going to Junior Church and learning more and spending some wonderful time with Joanne. So, but before we go, how about we just stand up all together and do our song? Look at that. I, ha I have the people of the, of the worship team doing song exercise today. So we are going to sing every second, every minute. Let's stand up and let's show off the moderator our good move in East Belfast. So if you, if you want, we have a couple of people that are really wonderful dancers in there. We have Hale there just showing us. Let's all and stand together and sing. Boys and girls, we are going to pray quickly, giving thanks for the money and praying that God, the ruler of all the earth, will make it useful for all of those families that are facing difficulties in Tanzania. Let's pray. Father, we are giving you thanks for Junior Church. We are giving you thanks for the provision of all the members of the congregation. And Father, we are praying especially at this morning for these 40 families in Tanzania. And we are praying also for the rest of the people in Tanzania. And we are praying that as you are the king of the whole world, the one that brings the rain and the sunshine, we are praying that you provide for them, that the crops will grow. And we are praying that as they receive this money, they will receive it with open arms, but also that they will be able to know then this is just a small example of Jesus' love for them. That is a lot bigger and is a lot more amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. UK boys and girls, you can go to Junior Church and continue learning more about Jesus. So before we come to, to the reading of a scripture in Psalm 1 and we listen to God's word, we are going to be reflecting in, in a song that many of you know, others you don't know so much. It's called, Yet No I, But Through Christ in Me. And so for this piece, you are more than welcome to sing it if you want seated 
or if you just want to listen and have a, mo a moment of meditation as you prepare your heart to receive God's word, feel free to do as you want at this time. Let's listen to this word.
That was my fault, by the way. I turned on my mic too early, and that's why we got the interference. Sorry about that, Karen, um, as well. Well, folks, can I just say that I have enjoyed coming to Mount Pottinger from the very moment I came in the door and was uh, met by Margaret, and uh, then I smelt the coffee, um, and then it's just been good fun. And it's been great to be here, and uh, uh, one of the things that I do as the moderator is to bring you greetings of the General Assembly. Uh, that really means that I say hello to you from all the other churches that are part of the uh, Fellowship of Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Uh, so from the folks in the Republic of Ireland, from the folks in the Presbytery of East Belfast, of course, and of course all through Northern Ireland as well, we say you are important and you are part of a church uh, that we love and we love you as part of that church as well. So I do bring you those greetings and they're sincere and I want you to know that we value you and we value your minister. It's great, Pago, to meet you for the first time. I, I, I have met Holly, by the way, um, uh, when she was working for Friends International and was down in Dublin, and I was able to meet her then and uh, looking forward to meeting her again today at some stage. So, yes, um, I'm wearing a white shirt. I thought I'd better blend in with the minister here. Um, so that was good as well. If you have your Bibles here, um, do open them at Psalm 1. Um, and uh, we'll look at this together. The other thing I should say, by the way, I was very encouraged by reading your, all the stuff of your church here. And if you look over there, you'll see that one of your ministers came from Ballycastle. Okay, I assume that's Ballycastle County Antrim. That's my hometown. And actually, there are Macachans still in the town. Um, and in the Presbyterian Church as well. So I'd love to do some more research in that as well. So the minister from Ballycastle. So you've got another Ballycastle man uh, in your uh, church this morning. I'm very proud of that. So let's look at God's word together. Folks, I have lived in the Republic of Ireland for over 25 years. I lived in Tipperary, uh, the county of Tipperary. That was in Clonmel, which is the county town. I was ordained on All-Ireland Final Hurling Sunday, um, and, uh, or weekend actually, and Tipperary were in the final, and their colors are blue and gold, and the whole town was bedecked in blue and gold. It wasn't for me, it was for the hurling team, who lost, by the way, to Clare. And I also have worked in Fermoy, which is in County Cork, um, in North Cork, in a small town there. I was the first minister in 37 years. Um, uh, that was there, and the place was really derelict when we first arrived. And I'm now working in uh, Dublin, in the city center, a bit like yourselves here uh, in Southside Dublin. But what I've discovered is that the church is under pressure. Um, because of the church is under pressure, because society has kind of turned against us, um, and uh, we're, we're being squeezed. Um, and so I've taken, as it were, uh, my theme this year is confident in Christ, as you see on the screen. I want to talk about that theme. Um, and I could rehearse all the things that have happened in, Bali, uh, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, but I'll leave that at, at the moment, because I think just to say that it is hard to be a Christian, that's, that's the bottom line. It is hard. Uh, when you went to the Republic of Ireland in the past, you kept your head down. You didn't actually speak out much. You didn't uh, raise your, your head up, as it were, as they say, above the parapet. And so you just were quiet. You lived your faith quietly, and everything else went on around you. In a sense, we might cower. We might just, that, that word, C-O-W-E-R, cower down. I was listening to Sunday sequence today. Um, I, it's something that I've now been able to do since I'm in this part of the world. Um, and they were talking uh, about, they had a lady on who was saying, we need to change. We need to give up all our beliefs on X, Y, and Z. We need to do something completely different. And I think that is what it were. We adjust our faith, as it were, to keep in step with our culture. In other words, we compromise. And I don't think we should do that either. And it will be easier, of course, to 
uh, to question what you were brought up to believe, as many of our young people are doing, and they're just simply walking away. They're caving in, as it were, to the pressure. So that's the reality. I think it's a reality in where I was living in Dublin. I'm sure it's a reality in Belfast as well. People in society reject Jesus, his institution and values. I wish they could come to church like this and see the vibrancy and the joy in the community of ordinary people meeting together. That's what they need. But what we see is that when people walk away from God, that we see symptoms. Uh, I was a doctor previously, so we look for symptoms of what's going on. And we hear things like, uh, you know, people have lots of personal problems. There's lots of tiredness about, lots of stress, lots of depression, much sleeplessness and despair. There's disorder in our law and order services, our health care, our schools, and our government. That's what happens when people walk away from God and they follow their own sinful paths. So I want to encourage us this morning by looking at someone not to reject Jesus and his ways, but to be confident in Christ. And he does that very helpfully by just painting two pictures. One is of an evergreen tree. You see that in verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. It's evergreen. And then he contrasts that with those symptoms that I was talking about of that dry, not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. So that's the two pictures, and we'll look at that as we go. Now, this is a wisdom psalm. It's at the very beginning of the Psalter um, because it's offering advice to us about how to live life and how to be confident in that life. So the first thing, if we get our first slide up, um, I think, well, will I do the slides? Will I do those? Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So the direction of a believer's life, we see that in verses 1 and 2. So this is a picture. Uh, when I was younger, um, uh, people think I'm young, but I'm actually not that young, but there we go. But when I was younger, I was in an outreach team, and we had a T-shirt that had a picture like this on it. Not quite this picture, but like that. And we, our mission was called Against the Flow. So you see all the fishes going in one direction, that's society, and you have this red fish going in another direction that is supposed to be the Christian. And when you read verses 1 and 2, it says, blessed is the one or the man in my version who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. So where's blessing? The blessing comes from not doing something. See that? They don't do things. And that's a way of blessing. The words are strong, aren't they? The wicked, sinners, mockers. And really that applies to people, doesn't it? And you think, well, I don't like calling people mockers and sinners and wicked. But really what it's saying is that those people do not have a relationship with God. That's how the Bible describes people who do not listen to God and do what God wants them to do. And they can do that indifferently. They can just be, just they just don't do anything. They don't come to church. They're not bad. But they're just not with God. And they can do it very angrily. They can do it very vehemently. They can stand up and criticize us publicly. They can go in that direction. It doesn't really matter. It's what's in their heart that matters. It's the default of the human heart, isn't it? That's what it says about every person. Every heart is wicked. We know that because we know our own ways. We were like that. Our thoughts are not his ways. We don't do what he wanted to do. That was the way that we lived our lives until we met him as our Lord and Savior. And also because of that ongoing presence of sin, we struggle, don't we, to go against the flow. So that's what we always, that's what we did until we met Jesus. We go this way, and that's important to see that. So the direction is important. We see that in our young people. Um, and again, this is how you need to work this out. Um, because what happens is that our young people are being bombarded, aren't they, on their phones? Um, and they're on, their, on the internet about, they're getting counsel, they're getting advice, they're getting people telling them how they should be living their lives. And much of, of it 
they will have to reject if they want to follow Jesus. And it's important, isn't it? And, and what I think is more important for you as a church and for me as a church minister is that we recognize how difficult it is for them. And so that rather than criticize them, we have to get alongside them. We have to, as it were, we have to stand with them, sit with them, walk with them. One of the big issues that we faced in Dublin, uh, because our boys, one of our boys in particular, was very good at sport and was playing it at such a high level, was the culture of alcohol. And what those young boys did, even as 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, as 18-year-olds, after the matches or the cups that they won, was that they basically got drunk. But you can't just say, no, that's wrong. We're going to have to walk with them, sit with them, talk to them, and try and convince them about the reality, of course, about Jesus, first of all, and about he, how we are to live in that situation. Identity is another big one. We need to start thinking about how we talk to our young people about that. And just giving them a verse is not going to work these days. We're going to have to get alongside them and walk in that situation. Work, again, was another situation uh, that is becoming increasingly different, uh, difficult in the city, isn't it? Where we've been told by the human resources people, as they say in our part of the world, HR, um, that, that that is where... You know, this is what you're to do. This is how you're to live, particularly with personal pronouns and things like that. Climate and environment. I was at the ploughing match in the Republic of Ireland, and the folks from the Irish Farmers Association were talking to me about nitrates and um, pollution. And we've seen it in Loch Ness, haven't we? The green algae. So how are we to walk with people at work? How are we to walk with our farmers? How are we to walk with people who are having to deal with these issues? Again, it's going to take time. They need to know God's law. They need to understand what it is, and we need to support them within the church. That is what's happening here. And the direction is important, isn't it? That's what that picture is saying. The direction is to not go in the direction of the world. And blessing comes when we know the counsel of the, of the Lord and we walk in it going to need each other to help us to do that. So that is my first point. I should have moved on. I'm not very good at these things. The direction of the believer's life and the word of God is needed in that. Um, so the second thing then is the delight in a personal God of a believer's life in a personal God. I don't know if, if like me, I'm trying to get you a picture here. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep forward. That works better if I do that. Um, has anybody got a, one of these um, Echo Dots? Have anybody got an Alexa? You got one of those? When I first got my Alexa, I used to say, please. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I used to say, well, for me it was RTE. I used to say, can I have RTE Radio 1, please? And then I thought, no, that, that's not quite right. Alexa is a, to me, it's a girl's name, but it's, it's not a, she's not a person in that way, is she? She's in it. But if you look in your Bibles there, in verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and Lord is in capital letters, L-O-R-D. That's because it's a translation of God's name, Yahweh. And I've told this story before, but um, I don't know who taught you Hebrew, Tagli, if you ever did Hebrew, maybe you didn't, but for me it was Professor MacGyver, and I did a homework for him, and I got that homework back on a page. I usually was quite good at school, um, but this had red lines everywhere. Everywhere it had red lines, and in the margins and everywhere. And then there was a bit at the bottom. So I read that, and it basically had told me that I had spelt the name of the Lord wrongly. So the three, you know, the, 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 the Hebrew letters, there's little bits in below, and I got them all mixed up. And Professor MacIver, in his dry wit, had said, the Lord likes to have his name spelt correctly. <laughs> because he's personal. Because he's real. Because we relate to him as we do to a personal, he is a personal God. So, that's, so you, how do you not follow the way uh, of those who are not God's people? 
we do that by recognizing the personhood of God. We see God as good. We see God as personal. We see God as loving. We see God as wise. We see God as powerful. And we say, I am related to that God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we counteract the pressure of peers by a deep love for God in Jesus Christ. By a relationship that actively seeks to know and follow what pleases him. And only one man, of course, did that perfectly. That was Jesus Christ. He rose early to read the scriptures. He spent time praying. He spoke boldly. He was not worldly at all. He, was loved. he loved people. He gave himself to him. And his life was the most attractive life that was ever lived. And folks, we need to say no to the lies of Satan that says to our young people and to us that if we follow Jesus, it's the most boring life in the world. And I hope this church and your pastor will disprove that to you and that you will know that for yourself as well. Because the direction of blessing and confidence is always towards God. It means walking in the counsel of God, standing and sitting with the righteous and those who love him and his word. That's the church. And that's where it comes from. And that's what we've got to do if we're going to stand up against the world and where it's taking us. So the direction of a believer's life is towards God and the light of the believer's life is in him and his word. And if we do that, it will inevitably mean that we swim against the world. And then we see in the next section uh, the description of the believer's life in verses 3 and 4. I've already told you these pictures. I'll, I'll not go on again about them. But just to give you a picture that um, I live in the city of Dublin. Uh, just to give you some geography, geog uh, Dublin has three rivers. Um, I'll just to see if you're awake. What's the biggest river in Dublin? The Liffey. The Liffey. Yes, I knew you'd know that. So does anybody know what the river on the north side is called? No, it's called the Tolka. And then if you want to know the one on the south side, it's called the Dodder. And I live by the Dodder River in the Manse there. It's beautiful, by the way, and you can walk along it. And um, it has these weeping willow trees. Um, and we had a weeping willow tree in our garden in the Manse, but it died um, because of lack of water. Because uh, there's another big tree that basically kills it, but that's another story. But the ones by the Dodder are beautiful. And they actually reach right down into the, the leaves are so good, they go right down into the water at times when they're heavy laden. And they're a beautiful thing, ver, uh, vibrant and verdant because of their proximity to the water. And so the description is easy to understand, isn't it? It's a metaphor of life. A person who is stable, that's planted, has vitality by streams of water, is productive, yields its fruit, durable, its leaf does not wither, prospers. And that's an idea of a flourishing life, isn't it? That's what's promised here, is a flourishing life. And those Psalms, of course, find their fulfillment, as I've said, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not about material prosperity. Jesus had no hurts, no riches, and yet the value of his life is, and his ministry are incalculable here because of the character that he had because of his closeness to his Father and to the Word of God. And so this picture in verse 3 is great, and it's connected to a series of promises. And the series of promises for life and relationship with God are staggering. The, picture, the life pictured is not as the world says, negative, boring, and wasted. It's a life that's fruitful, long-lasting, and prosperous. And folks, that's not just about conversion. That's what I, I think I want to try and get across as well. I know a lady who was so nervous in school that she could hardly function, and when she went to university, she had to take time off. But she discovered the gospel, and she discovered that God could change her heart through the application of the gospel. And so her anxiety was replaced by a confidence in Christ, and today she writes and she speaks in public on this whole topic. I know of a lady called Joan who came to our church in a wheelchair. She used to belong to another church, but because we're city center, she got worse because she had polio and she couldn't actually walk any longer. But not only that, she was losing her ability to hold her head up. And therefore, she was going to 
you know, her breathing was getting labored and things like that. I have never met a person with, with great joy. Who just zipped along in her little wheelchair and came into church, practically skid parking it into the back seat. And she went swimming two or three times a week in her wheelchair. Took the bus. And I can tell you a really good story about that. Because she had the Lord in her heart. She knew where she was going and she, she knew what she was doing. I've seen alcoholics in my job who've been addicted and you look at their life and they're wrecked, aren't they? Their skin is not good. Their liver is not as good as it should be. The quality of their muscle tone is not as good as it should be. But they have a joy and a hope and a patience because of this, because of the gospel. That's the reality of what God wants to do in his life. And to highlight that, he does talk about the wicked, doesn't he? That's the contrast there of little substance that get blown away and forgotten. That's not what we want. And so the picture of turning away from the influence of sinners and turning to the light of the instruction of God is an everlasting and fruitful tree planted by a constant stream of fresh water. And the outcome for the believer is a faithful, fruitful, confident Christian life that is more and more every day like Jesus. It's possible. That's the reality. And of course, one day, we will be made like him in perfection. And then we see, lastly, this, this idea, well, there's the two pictures there, the destiny of a believer's life in verses 5 to 6. It did strike me afresh, didn't it, in the original picture, that if this fish is going here, then it ends up somewhere different. And the other fish are going in another way. They end up in a different location. That is a sober conclusion about the life of the unbeliever. And that's what verses 5 and 6 do. It says the wicked will not stand in judgment when Jesus returns when they die and face him, they will not be able to stand because they're not trusting in him, regardless of what their life is like. And even go on, they will not be able to sit in the assembly of righteous. They won't be in heaven. They won't be with other believers because they didn't belong to the believers while they were here as well. Jesus is very clear that he will come back and judge each person. And the only way to stand in judgment is with the righteousness of of Christ. There will be no communion of believers. They will not be admitted. There is no hope for them. And yet the destiny of the believer is different, isn't it? That's the hope that sustains us. The gospel tells us that the wages of sin is death. It tells us that humanity is destined to die once and to face the judgment that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Jesus is the one who is appointed the judge of the living and the dead. So Paul sums it up, doesn't he, in Ephesus to the Ephesian church. He says, because of the great love, because of his great love for us. Hear that. Because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Folks, we are confident as believers in Jesus Christ of our destiny. We are confident that we will stand at the judgment because of Jesus. We are confident that we will sit in the assembly of the righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. And we are confident that we will not because the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is what I hope my message to the church will be. It's an important song. It is a vital song of life. It teaches us that life lived in relationship with God is about blessing and flourishing. And such a life begins with an acceptance of the gospel and it continues in a daily delighting in God listening to his instruction and following his ways. So let me encourage you to do that, to travel in that direction in this church and in this community in that confidence of life. And just to very lastly finish, you, you see at the end there it says, for the Lord watches over the way 
of the righteous. I like to get this in almost every sermon I preach that I'm a Manchester City fan. Now, up to, the, up to this point, it is worth this illustration, but of course we got beat by Newcastle yesterday. No, not Newcastle, sorry. Wolves yesterday, 2-1. But one of the reasons that we're good is because we probably have the best coach in the world, Pep Guardiola. And I want to say to you folks that you have the best coach in the world in God, in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating to think about it like that, that he is with you, he cares about you, he talks to you, he is your presence. And that is that life lived in relationship with God. It is blessed because the Lord watches over you. You will not flounder. You will flourish. We can be confident of that. Let's pray. Father, I do want to say thank you to you for the wisdom of this psalm. I want to say thank you as well for the perfection of the life of Jesus. I want to say thank you for how he lived out of this psalm and is our example. And I pray that we, though squeezed by the world and squeezed by the pressure of the temptations of our sinful nature, that we will go to Jesus. And that, Father, that we will know him more and more each day and trust him. And that, Father, that you will increase our confidence, not just as individuals, but as a community of your people as we seek to live out for him in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
please don't rush home. There is lovely tea, coffee, and some buns, and we are going to have the opportunity of everybody say hello. And maybe if Karen allows, you can give a hug to the moderator too, maybe. Grace, love, and fellowship that can only be found in Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore, and the whole church say, Amen. Many blessings.